So our next speaker for this afternoon is a Professor uh, Rosen Owens. So I'm sure my pronunciation is awful. Rosen, can you correct me? Yeah, it's Roshin, but no, no problem. Okay. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, she's a professor in Cambridge University, so in the UK. And um, yes, we can see you now. Okay, that's good. So nice to meet you. Uh, virtually, I hope uh, Roshin was supposed to join Chaos, but with the travel restriction, it was too complicated to organize. So um, please, when you are ready, you can share your screen. That's great. We see your slides. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, you can all hear me okay, I hope. And um, hello from sunny Cambridge, although I'm sure it's not as sunny um, as at Kaust. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there today. We we did try, um, but it, it wasn't to be. But I'll do my best to um, to tell you my story, even if it's not in person. And I've put my uh, contact details there um, if uh, there were any questions that we couldn't cover today. So what I want to talk to you about is adapting to opportunity. And this is really about what I call real life. The fact that life is not always smooth. We've just had a, a beautiful illustration of that from the, the previous speaker, but you just have to go with the flow and seize the opportunities as they arise and see what can happen. So in my life, things have not gone as smoothly as I had hoped. I had all kinds of thoughts when I was um, younger about what I wanted to do. Um, some of my career aspirations were uh, interesting. So you, you'll see in these photographs, um, my parents favored something that's known as that bowl haircut, which was where you would put a bowl on a child's head and cut around. But anyway, um, so I had aspirations to be a musician when I was younger. Also thought about being a painter. Um, this is me aged about six, um, mostly painting myself. Um, considered being an explorer. Here's me with my brother and my mother um, telling them which way we should go. Um, and then when I got more serious about things, if anybody asked me from the age of about five until about the age of 11, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would tell them that I wanted to be a bank lady in California. And I can't explain where that came from. Just suffice to say that it was a fixed notion in my mind for quite a long time. It wasn't until... I was a bit older that uh, a passion for science um, struck me. Um, when I was about 17, I, I think I decided I definitely wanted to, to be a chemist. And that persisted. I studied um, natural sciences at university, which is quite a broad course. You can, you can choose all kinds of different sciences. Um, and it wasn't until I was about uh, 20, so I was, I was in my third year of university, that I saw Professor John Walker, um, who had won a Nobel Prize um, for his work on a protein called ATP synthase. And I saw that talk and I knew I, I had to be a biochemist. Um, later on, I was sure I wanted to work in industry. After that, <laughs> I was sure I wanted to go back to academia. I do remember one very strong thought I had after my second bout of maternity leave was any job would do as long as I could um, put my son in daycare. <laughs> I do love my children, but I was also very happy to be um, at work. So I've had quite a varied career path. Um, and I, you know, sometimes I hear about people who have this very directional career path where they know what they want to be. They know where they want to go to university. They know what they want to study and they know what their job. Is. And that is definitely not true for me. But what I will say is that I was listening and open to what might be a possibility. And for me, it's about a balance. It's not just about the job. It's about a a life balance, a family balance. And so many of my decisions were not just about um, the career. And I think that's, I'm gonna generalize here, but I think that's typical of a lot of women. They have a lot of people that they think about in their sphere 
And I think women tend to be very community minded as well. So a lot of my decisions were sort of a holistic, you know, how do we make this work? So I told you I started uh, in Ireland and that's where I grew up. I did my um, bachelor's in natural sciences and then I went to the United Kingdom to do a PhD in biochemistry. Um, after that, I moved to the United States. Um, I had, I was doing biochemistry for my PhD, but in the context of infectious diseases. And um, when you work in infectious diseases, you, you tend to talk about your, um, you know, infectious disease of choice being the, the sort of the, the, the most efficient killer. I know that's a terrible way to think of things, but um, having worked on enteropathogenic E. coli, I wanted to go for something more serious. So I decided to work on tuberculosis. So that was at Cornell University uh, in upstate New York. And um, I, I can tell you, it's all about a man. I, I met a man in, in the States. And so then I was in the States for a number of years. And um, I worked... I think I did two postdocs in total, both in the vet school, but then I worked in a startup. Now, part of this was about the opportunity, but part of it was having a family and around that time having a small child. Um, so I worked in the small company and it was great. I learned a lot, but I knew then that I wanted to go back to academia. So then I went back and I did another postdoc in biomedical engineering. And by that stage, I was pretty sure that I needed to stay in research and um, I got an independent position and I moved with my husband to the south of France and there we stayed for almost a decade. Um, and that, that was my opportunity to build up my own group. And um, it was only in 2017 that I was offered a job at the University of Cambridge um, in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. So you see, I had quite a diverse um, sort of career path and many of the decisions were taken because of a personal reason or because of having children or because a passion collided with a you know a passion for research collided with a particular opportunity at the time so not necessarily the straight shot that that you might think but I I do think that I've landed on my feet in Cambridge and um the you know, the job that I have here, it, it resulted from a lot of hard work, but I'm really enjoying it. And who knows what will happen in the next 10 years. But for the moment, things are good here in Cambridge. So during this career journey, um, I had the opportunity to work in a lot of different areas. Um, and my training as a biochemist, um, I had done natural sciences, like I said, so, you know, a bit of an analytical slant to things. And what frequently um, frustrated me about biological sciences was that you would often use some sort of technology to interrogate your biological system. But for a biologist, it, it was somewhat of a black box. We, the, the biologist tended not to understand what the technology was, you know, it was more like you have an instrument, you press a button and you get some sort of a signal out of it. But I was interested to know what the technology was and how could I adapt the technology to best suit my purposes. And I really think that drove me, that, that frustration at not being able to have an input into what the technology was. And so I think the journey that I went on allowed me to think about this in a new way. And um, this image here describes really the work of my group in Cambridge, which is thinking about cell biology or even subsets of cells, or even, you know, bigger complexes of cells and tissues and organs, and thinking about how to interrogate them, how to understand what's happening in a biological system. Now, most of what we do is in vitro, so in the lab rather than in vivo, but um, even there, we want to assess the biology in a way that's non-invasive to the biology. We don't want to change the biology by measuring it. Um, and I view this as an iterative thing where we're looking at the biology and adapting a technology to, um, to measure something. 
And then we learn something about that technology, which allows us to improve it and adapt it even more towards the biology. So that's the, the, the mantra in the group. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't worked in all those domains, if I hadn't worked in the startup, if I hadn't worked in the engineering department, if I hadn't worked as a biologist looking at infectious diseases. So um, that's what we currently do. And um, one of the big projects that we have in the lab is um, trying to understand something called the gut-brain axis. So um, probably you've all heard of the microbiome and we know that it's very, very important in our everyday lives, in health and in disease but it's not that well understood. And there seems to be this complex interplay between our um, gastrointestinal tract and our brain. This is just one of the ways the microbiome affects us. Now, this came about because of books I'd been reading and a personal experience of um, having been ill and um, feeling you know, more than mildly depressed and wondering, why that was and understanding that there was a link between my anxiety and depression and the um the fact that i'd been ill now i it, it's possibly um you know correlation more than causation but it started me on a track of trying to understand what had gone wrong and what this might be about doing a lot of reading and then having the epiphany that i could actually use my research to try and understand this better and what I've illustrated here is just thinking about what were the different strands of things that I had learned or acquired along the way? What were the things that I could do to bring this project to bear and, and to make it work? And it was everything, well, initially, of course, you have to get funding to be able to do research. So I'd learned a lot about grant writing and paper writing um, you know, in the startup as well as in my academic positions. I had also learned how to communicate between engineers and biologists while I was doing postdocs in various different um, uh, departments. Um, I knew about project and team management. Um, I'd had to learn how to present and communicate uh, to a lay audience as well as to a scientific one. And then importantly, I had built up a lot of expertise in all kinds of things related to biology and engineering. At the time, I felt like a bit of a, um, there's an expression, you know, to be jack of all trades and master of none. But in this case, it actually um, worked in my favor. So um, I was able to develop a project that would use technology to try and understand the gut brain axis in an in vitro model. Some of that technology um, was related to something I had come across while I was a postdoc at Cornell after I met my husband, who was working in this very interesting field called uh, organic electronics. Now, organic electronics, um, instead of using traditional electrode materials, uses uh, conducting polymers. And what I was very taken by as a biologist was that these materials were polymeric. And even if you look at what they're composed of chemically, it, it really looked like, from a biochemist perspective, the building blocks of biology, carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens. And what was interesting about these materials was that they could be soft. Now, I'll, I'll come on to why that's important, but um, it started to look like these were a class of technological materials that could be adapted more towards biology. And early people like Robert Langer showed that cells responded to these materials when they were electrically um, biased. So that's shown in the pictures on the left and that you could, you could tune the mechanical properties of these materials. So this was again, an opportunity, you know, talking to my husband, talking to his students, realizing that here was this interesting technology that could be used by a biologist and starting to apply those. I think initially I worked with his students uh, on the weekends, moonlighting, and then started to realize that I, I wanted to work on these materials for myself. It's interesting in biological sciences that we don't really use a lot of electrical measurements. A lot of what biologists do is optical monitoring. But if you think about the fundamentals of a cell and how it works, iron flow is everywhere. And how a cell 
keeps ions in, keeps ions out, how it signals to other cells, how a nerve signals is all about ion flux. And understanding that made me realize that electronic materials were really the way forward for monitoring biological systems. Um, my understanding of that then, you know, fast forward quite a few years, allowed me to apply interesting electrical monitoring techniques to um, understanding the gut-brain axis. So how, how would we do that exactly? So this was, um, this is a, a nice figure that one of my PhD students for, made for a review where she thought about the gut and the brain and what we might have in the gut. We might have hormones and neurotransmitters that could be uh, produced. We um, could measure those electrically. We, we'd shown that. We have nerve signaling, so we could look at how the enteric nervous system, that's the one in the gastrointestinal uh, tract, would uh, operate. And we knew that the vagus nerve was very important. And we also had this property of electrical resistance of, a, of a, an intact, healthy gut tissue. So here again was me saying, I can take these interesting electrical methods and apply them to some very interesting biology. And not just to the gastrointestinal tract, but of course to the brain, because one of the important barriers in the brain is the blood-brain barrier and how that functions and how electrically tight it is, is a major marker for um, you know, health and disease. If it's tight, it's it's good, it's it's healthy. And if it's if it's not, if it's permeable, that can signal all kinds of uh, problems and dysfunctions. So that was using the electrical methods and being able to apply them to a problem that was interesting to me. Another interesting problem and an opportunity was discussions with biologists about the fact that biology isn't 2D, and yet biologists have used two-dimensional growth of cells as shown in the Petri dish um, for a long time, but it doesn't actually represent biology. And then here, again, the opportunity was thinking, if I'm working with material scientists, they've got all kinds of interesting ways of thinking about things from a structural, mechanical property, um, mechanical sense, and how could we grow things in, in three dimensions? Of course, tissue engineers have been doing this for quite a while now, but this was another opportunity, trying to advance things, trying to model biological systems in a more realistic way. So around that time, um, this was still, um, this was after we had moved to France, um, I learned from some material scientists about how they were making um, three-dimensional porous structures. They look a bit like a sponge. You can squish them. They're, they're mechanically compliant um, and they could still be an active electrode. So we took this material that we use a lot called P.PSS and we freeze dried it. Um, Shaika Nal, who's professor at Kaus, she was one of the lead authors in one of these papers. Um, so setting this off, um, starting it, she um, showed that you could make scaffolds out of these materials. And what we realized was, was that these were very similar to what tissue engineers had been using to grow cells in three dimensions. But you couldn't just, you, you didn't have to only grow them in three dimensions, you could use the electrical properties. So this was the opportunity to do something a bit like 3D um, biology, but thinking about it in a synthetic biology way where you're building in a new functionality at the heart of the tissue, that is to measure the properties of the tissue. And so this was a device we called the, the tubister, where we made three-dimensional tubes um, and we grew cells inside. And not only did we um, grow the cells and we could image them, we could show that they were alive, but we could also electrically monitor them. Um, and what was very interesting here was when we added the various different cells into this very biomimetic scaffold, what we saw was that the cells auto-organized. The cells that were supposed to be on the lining of the gut were on the lining of the gut, producing lots of nice mucus that would allow microbes to be um, situated there. And the other cells were in the bulk of the scaffold doing what they should do, which is supporting the epithelial tissue. Now I've gone into a lot of detail here, but this is, I think, the illustration of a project which allowed me to combine 
sort of various different interests, bringing in various different things that I'd learned along the way that allowed me to do this work. And if you're interested, we've, we've published a few things on this, or I'd be happy to answer questions if, if people want to contact me later. But it, it, it suffice to say, it's a project that we had that I think is a, a passion project for me. We've gone a little bit of a, in a different direction now because we were making these really nice three-dimensional tubes. But as a biologist, I realized that it wasn't that compatible with how biologists do their everyday work. And so we've been trying to think about trying to adapt to um, a format that biologists like, like a 12 well plate or a 24 well plate, and thinking about how you adapt to all of the technologies like microscopes or robots or plate readers that biologists use. And so we've taken those scaffolds and we've adapted them into these well plates. And now we're thinking about how to monitor cell growth within those um, well plates. Um, and so it's, it's not just about doing um, science for science sake, it's also thinking, um, and the previous speaker mentioned this as well, how do you translate that? How do you make it useful? And I think a problem that sometimes engineering and physical sciences have is that, you know, development of technology without really thinking about the end user. And the opportunity I had was that I'd been an end user, I'd been somebody who was frustrated by these things, and I could actually inform and, and, and push back a little bit and say, no, we really need to adapt to a particular format that's going to work. So we've been using these and we've gotten some nice results showing we can get different tissue types and we're pushing this further. We're trying to improve the complexity. We're showing that we can get um, vasculature in there, gastrointestinal tract, we're now growing lung cells. And we've been talking a lot with um, clinicians and with people who are interested in drug discovery to, um, think about what types of cells they want in there, how do they want us to adapt these um, devices and make them useful. And, and a, a sort of a typical type of a drug screening assay would be that you'd add a chemical compound to your three-dimensional complex tissue um, and you might have a healthy version and a disease version and you'd be able to see how these things change. So um, I, I want to show you one final um, slide here which just shows you I think something I'm very proud of which is an illustration of what a tissue should look like and then an illustration taken from a pathology slide of a slice through one of our tissues showing that even though you have this synthetic material in there um, it, it really doesn't um, it, it doesn't look too invasive. The scaffold has blended into the tissue. And so again, the opportunity to use these conducting polymer materials as ways to, to host cells and tissues, but also to monitor them um, was really a, a good journey to go on. And we're very proud of the work we've done so far and a lot of the work we will do in the future. Now I want to finish um, hopefully I'm still on time, I want to finish with um, a couple of maybe bits of advice or bits of um, things that I've learned along the way that maybe could be helpful to people who are at an earlier stage of their journey. Um, and these literally are a, a sort of a me writing down in no particular order things that I think um, could be useful. So um, during my research journey, I found that finding good collaborators was crucial because you can't possibly, especially in a multidisciplinary science world, you can't possibly know how to do everything. And you can have really good collaborators that you work well with. And sometimes those can be in Saudi Arabia or sometimes they can be in Cambridge. It doesn't necessarily have to be that the person who's in the department next door is going to be a good collaborator. And so it can mean the difference between you know, having somebody far, far away, but who's a good collaborator who you interact well with. And you have to be a good collaborator as well. You have to give back and be somebody who who gives and who is willing to collaborate and um, share uh, information and data and so on. Um, often you will, as a an academic or presumably in other areas of of of, of science, you will have people who give you feedback. 
And you may often get conflicting feedback and you don't know how to do it. You know, how, how do you integrate it? Well, my advice is you integrate the feedback, but in the end, you're the person who has to decide, is this proposal right? Is this manuscript right? You, you then have to trust your gut because what your gut is, you know, obviously we work on the gut, but what it is, your gut feeling is, is your experience and your intuition telling you how to proceed. Um, something I learned the hard way was that you should sleep on email. Uh, when you get uh, an email and it's something, maybe some bad news or something you don't like, give it 24 hours. Sometimes the problem will solve itself. Um, in my lab, we foster a very, very democratic uh, environment. In other words, you know, I really hope that people have a safe space to say what they need to say and, and tell me um, their thoughts and things. I'm a big believer in not staying in the same place. I've moved around a lot and I think I've learned a lot from those moves culturally and scientifically. I have a life. <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean, I have other outside interests. I struggle to keep those um, alive, but they give me perspective and allow me to come back to work with a bounce in my step after a particularly hard day. Um, the previous speaker talked about her children um, and, you know, it, it may not have been the time that suited her. Having children for me wasn't a, necessarily a time that suited me for my career, but you just do it when you want to, if you want to have children. And if you don't, that's also a great decision. Um, there isn't a good time. So sometimes people ask me, when should I have children? And there, there isn't a good time. So, you know. That's um, just something to bear in mind. I wrote here, don't marry your boss, but that was bad advice because I did actually marry my boss. Then later on, I became his boss. Um, it, it, it was just an illustration that really sometimes you have no control over what happens um, and you just, you, you just run with it. The last thing I wanted to say was that there's no crying in science. This is from a movie called League of Their Own, where um, one of the characters says to another, there's no crying in baseball. It's really just me saying that if, you know, science regularly makes you very upset, that maybe that's a, a sign that, you know, you, you need to move to something that, that is not so upsetting or that it, again, you know, part of having a life that you, you really need to keep things in perspective. So I'll finish there. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge a lot of people who have shaped my career and also research work and um, having a healthy research environment. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Roshan. Uh, you didn't see the room, but we are all laughing at your last slide. Everyone was taking picture. <laughs> so there are some sentences that, uh, yeah, that are ringing a bell for us. So do we have any question in the room for Roshan? Actually, uh, hi, Roshan, it's Nadia. Um, we were laughing on your uh, question, on your uh, don't marry your boss. Uh, piece of advice. So, did you mean that literally or figuratively <laughs> that you that you became his boss? <laughs> well, so at the time, um, so let's see. I'm trying to think of the timeline. Um, he wasn't my boss when I married him, but later on, he became my boss. And then uh, I think I was a very good employee. But after that, he he quit as a department head, and I became department head. This is when we were in France. And I think he was one of the worst employees I ever had. <laughs> um, it, it just, if you think about it very practically, then your husband can never write you a reference letter, can never nominate you for everything because it's, it's a, obviously a conflict of interest. Oh, yes. But I wrote it down because so many scientists meet their other halves in science. It just is the way we work. So it, it was sort of tongue in cheek. All right, now I'm going to ask you just a technical question. Uh, you're, first of all, uh, I'm a novice and layman when it comes to science of that kind, medical uh, biology and all this. Um, but I found your presentation fascinating. 
and the relationship between the gut and the brain. I mean, obviously, you hear you are what you eat, right? Yeah. And uh, we're, there's so much now research on that uh, in modern uh, nutrition and health, and everybody's talking about diet. So mm. what would you recommend to us from your perspective as a scientist to us ladies who yeah. care about our health as we grow older? Yeah. Oh, that's a hard one. And, and what's interesting is that you are what you eat. It's a very interesting thought. It's very existential to think that maybe your microbes are telling you what you're hungry for. I, I thought that was fascinating when I realized that your microbe composition could be influencing your 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 desire you know your cravings for things um the things i've learned from a technical perspective is that you really need to have a very diverse diet um you know the things we we know about being sugar, low in sugar and high in fiber it makes sense from a microbe composition um and i don't know how things are in saudi arabia but there's a real an unfortunate push in the uk for cesarean section sometimes it's absolutely necessary uh, and it's a me medical emergency but the so-called elective cesarean can really damage your child's um future health and there are ways to recover it there are ways to because their their start in life depends on a, a vaginal birth and breastfeeding also being very important for a child's health so there's lots of uh, advice out there and of course you know when you take antibiotics taking a a probiotic after the course of antibiotics, which our grandmothers knew. Um, you know, things like, um, what's the name of the fermented milk drink? Um, those things we we were taking long before we ever knew what they were for and yogurts and things like that, live cultures are all very good for us. Thank you, this is really interesting. Can I have the only personal question? Uh, when you are working with your husband and he's drinking Coca-Cola several times per day, what would you say to him? Well, so he's Greek and Greeks only have Coca-Cola when they have, um, when they're sick. I, I do not know why, but they think it's this magic thing that um, cures all ills. But luckily he tends not to drink Coca-Cola the rest of the time. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, we need to move to the next speaker. Thank you, Roshan. It was great. Thank you.